ultimately, if you want a relationship to continue, you've got to deliver. It doesn't say you've always got to deliver. And I think quite an interesting distinction that you can draw is one whereby you appreciate the people are not only paying for a person or a commodity, but they're paying for a process. And so you can have situations where you don't hire anybody. But as long as you've gone through that process, and in the course of doing that, you've demonstrated why they haven't been able to make the hire, what they're going to need to do in order to make the hire, then your consulting, it carries on. So I've got any number of situations where I haven't successfully filled an assignment, but it's not been perceived to be a failure. If you think it's a failure, they're going to think it's a failure. But if you can fall back and say, no, I've got an awful lot of value that I can add here, and I can tell you how to make this hire, then that's what you need to do. So top tips. Again, varies very much on your business model. However, I know you're probably going to have bosses that are driving you really hard and they're moaning about their bottom line and how they've got to turn it around. It's all about volume. In my case, I decided to lie to my line manager and pretend there was revenue where it wasn't so that I could do this bit. So I could go and meet my client and get to know their business just because I had a different philosophy to the lady that owned my business didn't mean that I, which is why I'm now able to run my own business. Ensure in-depth candidate interviews, knowing your candidate. It's got value on every single level. Again, if you're new to the game, if you're just starting out in recruitment, and something I would like to say is the fact that you're all here after the three, four years that we've had speaks volumes to me. It's a great time for us. Shysters have gone out of business. If you're still around and you're still trading, there's got to be something to it. So I think you should applaud yourselves from that perspective. But knowing your candidate, in 10 years' time, your candidates are going to be your clients. So you know them, you stick with them, and it gives you a longer-term play in what is quite a, quite a tough industry. Know the roles inside out. It's about being credible. You don't have to have the answer to every question, but it's worth getting to grips with the roles you're handling. An interesting case in point, from my perspective, and I'm slightly going back a few slides here, but... I used to do a lot of work for a company based up in Hull. And there was a very no another large organization based up in Hull. And I was hauling six hours up the um, whatever it is to get there. And I, just, I didn't want to do it for just the one client meeting. They were in completely different sectors. But an ability to talk knowledgeably about how you get people to go and live in Hull was actually all it took. Because that was the problem. So phoning up the HR director saying, completely different sector. I know nothing about R&D and consumer products, but what I do know is how to sell hull. <laughs> Turn into a great relationship. Market roles to candidates against their needs, warts and all. Um, there's no reason to shoehorn anybody into a job. I don't know how you guys feel about it, but people in recruitment very often have a tendency to feel that they're there to protect the candidate or they're there to protect the client. And I know it's the client's that actually pay our fees, but if we think about it in the broader scheme of things, whose livelihood is really at stake? You know, for whom is the impact of a bad job move the worst? So you've got to be able to tell your candidates all the reasons why they do want to work for a company, but you also might want to point out why they don't want to work for a company. Apart from anything else, it helps you at the close, further downstream, when you're the one that's telling them what their objections should be, you're obviously controlling the whole thought process. Three reasons why I rule. Get the candidates to tell you why they're good. The reverse marketing thing that you mentioned, one of the best moments I ever had in business was when I'd specced a very senior candidate into a prospect client, but I got him to write the email. I got him to write... I have to admit, it was an area in the space I knew nothing about. He had good reasons of wanting to work there. I thought I could stage the introduction. So he wrote the email with all the reasons why they should want to interview him sent it in to the HR director. I get a call saying, you know your candidates this well, we need to be talking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's lying without a license. It's absolutely fine. Fully prepare your candidates for interview? Yes. Give them all the information they need to perform. Don't tell them what to do to get the job. Again, completely transparent. If your client knows that you're trying to get a candidate who's not necessarily fit for purpose into a job, they're never going to brief you again. What's the point? I don't know if any of you have ever done in-house roles. Have you ever been in-house? 
It's quite an interesting experience. I did it for a period of time, but as a third party. And what I found was, firstly, the thing that made me the most cross was candidates that bore no resemblance to the CV and the little profile that had been submitted. I was appalled at the lengths that people would go to to get an interview. Now, I can only assume that they're judged on their send-outs and their interviews rather than the revenue that they actually bill at the end of the day. And in terms of the KPIs that you will work to, they'll probably be similar, but different. But if you are KPI'd on anything other than revenue, you're <coughs> going to start making the wrong decisions about what you do and why. So fully prepare your candidates for interview, but don't try and create the ideal candidate. Update clients and candidates throughout the whole process. So important. And that's including the candidates that you don't think are going to get the job. Um, communication, it's just a call. It can be a text. It can be an email. But if people don't feel important at any point in time, they're going to start reading into that. So communicate, be professional. If you want to deliver status reports, you can. But just talk to them. Great counter-offer management process actually goes back to these candidate needs. Obviously, the biggest, blackest hole we all fall into. <laughs> Yay, I've made a fee. Oh, no, he's been counter-offered and he's not going to join. <laughs> Happens all the time at all levels. There isn't a hard and fast rule for how you can stop it, but knowing your candidate and having your candidate trust you that you are holding their best interests at heart. And you do have to do this. If you want to sustain in the industry, feel good about what you do, you can't have it be about you. Your need to bill, your need to do this. It has always got to be about your client and about your candidate. If that's the case, you'll have a great counter-offer management process or you'll be telling your client before offer, look, there's no point. They're not going to take the job. Again, great credibility for any repeat business thinking in the longer term. Oh, share interview feedback. I spent years lying to my candidates and saying, it's not you, it's them. They've had a change. You're too good. Any of those different stories. My then boss said, uh, who are you trying to be nice to here? It was more important to me that they liked me than it was that they actually get a job. So I changed that, and I'm brutal with my feedback now. And if they say he got all his toothbrushes out and showed them to us and he looked like a right twat, that's what I say. You know that happened. Ah. Uh, no, you didn't get your toothbrushes out. <laughs> Another situation in that I had a situation where a candidate who the client wanted to move to final was behaving really strangely and saying strange things about her interview, denying ever meeting me, and the whole thing started to get a bit weird. And it was <laughs> sat there for a while thinking, they want to see her, they want to take her to final. I think she's a complete lunatic. Decided to phone them and say, listen, I'm not happy with this. She's demonstrating some really, really unhealthy behaviours. I think we should pull her out of process. Again, short term, bit of an owl. Could have pushed it through. Long term, relationship that's sustained, still going on. Implement a quality audit scheme. Get somebody other than you to phone them up and ask them how it went. Ooh, again, it hurts. Don't like it at all. But they're not going to tell you the truth. Even if they think you've done the worst job on the planet, they're going to be saying, no, 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 it's fine. Yes, we'll talk in a few weeks' time. Don't worry about that. They're going to hang up the phone, tell all their colleagues, don't bother, no point. But get somebody who's higher up in the... Well, it actually doesn't need to be higher up in the hierarchy. You can get a colleague to pretend to disguise the fact that they're a colleague. I run the quality audits. Client's going to think they care about quality. They measure it. That's important. You get the feedback, and it's a lot easier for somebody who's not so involved in it to ask the right questions. Where else does a business sit? Would you recommend them to talk to so-and-so? No, you wouldn't. Why not? Do you think somebody else might do better? Benefits your business, which ultimately is going to benefit you. What else? I think that as long as you keep your eye on what the game really is here, and again, I'm going to come back to it, it's not about billing a fee. I appreciate that's the reality of this, and if we don't, nobody's going to make money. But if we make this about loving what we do, 
enjoying our interactions with our candidates, enjoying our interactions with our clients, and really caring about the outcome. A theme I've noticed in recruiters, particularly successful recruiters, is they need to be liked. It's not easy needing to be liked because you spend your whole time worrying about the fact that you might not be. It is quite a good motivator to make sure you do the right things for people. Um, and so I would say feel it and love it. And if you don't, you might want to query how long you want to stay in the industry for. Because when it does all fall together, it's actually not so hard. Um, and I have worked at all levels. I mean, obviously, I've moved up through search, but I started, oh, hey, you know, banging a phone, sending people out. And a lot of those skills, like the diarising, the management of the processes, have stood me in extremely good stead. Now I'm doing the stuff that appears to be a little easier, certainly from the fee value perspective. I think that's it. Thank have I missed you. anything? Can I just say? If you implement a quality audit scheme where you're in touch with your clients and candidates throughout the guarantee period, with per candidates with permission of your clients, obviously, you will differentiate yourself massively from the flog it and leg it brigade who place somebody and they don't, they, you, you don't hear from these consultants for at least 12 weeks. And then when they've got their fee, they'll be in touch. Now, if you're not like that, good for you, because that makes you different. If you're in touch every four weeks during the quality, the, the, the guarantee period, or whatever you call it, rebate period, then you will be different. And it's a really nice way to check that everything's going OK. Really makes you stand out. Um, and also quality audit every year with your top clients. Go back and see them because every time they see you, they are reminded of how great you are and you will have opportunity to get closer to them. Um, so it's not about seeing them once and then it's all telephone or email. Get in front of them because 55% of the way we communicate is face to face and you're losing that if you don't get in front of them. That's what I'd say on that. So wow them with a fantastic service, and that all helps the relationship.